So hello everyone and welcome to Innova's Research Network event. I am Tavian Hunter, I'm the Library and Archive Manager of the Stuart Hall Library at Innova. And I'm here with my colleagues Samina, in Innova's Program Coordinator and Anahi, Program Producer and our translator for today's talk. To give some context, the Research Network is the library's public program of monthly presentations and reading groups. It acts as a testing ground for new ideas by, by providing a meeting place for artists, curators, and practitioners to discuss aspects of their research-based practice with a wider audience and to seek response from those working in and around their field, particularly individuals who engage with Innova's work. It's an opportunity to critically discuss discourse around specific themes and to frame a deeper conversation utilizing the Stuart Hall Library and archive collections. This year's program, Global Revisions, launched during Innova's 25th year anniversary, looks to reignite debate and reflect on the concept of globalization and new internationalism, expanding on our founding ideas which were articulated in our first conference in 1994 and can be found in essays printed in the accompanying publication, Global Visions, towards a new internationalism in the visual arts. In this series of talks, we have examined the legacy of the non-aligned movement, explored the iconography of the veil in the works of contemporary female Iranian artists, looked at the Caribbean as a place of emergence for so-called global societies, and challenged conventional notions of belonging and difference in diasporic art and investigated ways in which migration between mainland China, Hong Kong and the West across generations has been entangled with internationalism, identity politics and globalization. Today's talk and selected film screening is a, the final event in our Global Revisions program it seeks to explore dialogue on resistance and artistic practices in Latin America and the Arab world. As we partake in the conversation about the expression of protests and artistic production, we would like to disclaim to everyone um, that there may be imagery or discussion present that could be distressing for some people. We completely understand if some of you decide to leave and for those who stay, we hope this will be an engaging conversation with mutual respect and care. Excited today to have our speakers, um, Larissa Sansom, Regina Galindo and Fortunata Calabro here with us today. Larissa, a Palestinian born artist that works mainly with film and produces insul installations, photos and sculptures with the interactions of myth and historical narrative central to her work that has been shown in film festivals and museums worldwide. Regina is a visual artist and poet that lives and works in Guatemala. She uses performance as her main medium to explore and denounce the ethical implications of social violence and injustices related to racial and gender discrimination as well as human rights abuses. And Fortunata is an art historian, curator, activist, and art producer based in London. Her research focuses on the interrelation between contemporary artistic practices in Latin America and the Arab countries, where she addresses transnational social and political issues. So I thank you all for being here, um, especially across different time zones. And I will now hand over to Fortunata. Thank you. Thank you, Tavian, for uh, this introduction. And uh, before I start my, uh, my reading, I would like to thank Ineva for, this, for gathering us all together today. It's very nice to have this kind of meeting nowadays. And a big thanks to Larissa Sansur and Regina Jose Galindo for uh, being here with us and sharing with us their knowledge and uh, their art. I'm going to share with you um, a paper I've written on Larissa and Regina, in which I will talk uh, briefly uh, about the video we are going to watch uh, later on and uh, other few works of each of them. 
So we'll start with, uh, with Larissa. So Larissa Sansur works developed the mainly in the form of videos and photographs respond to the Palestinian question. Through her work, she redefines issues debated on the subject of Palestine, political negotiations, ideas of belonging, and the Palestinian state. Larissa Sansur was born to a Palestinian father and a Russian mother in Jerusalem and raised in Bethlehem. Like many Palestinians born in the 70s in the West Bank, she has experienced Palestine under direct military occupation by Israel. She had then, like many other students who wanted to continue their education, to leave Palestine with the first uprising, the Intifada of the 1988, as most schools in the West Bank closed. The idea of one of I have to share my presentation before, sorry. <laughs> Otherwise, I cannot show the work, sorry. Let me, uh, slide show from the start. Yeah, okay, here we are, sorry. Uh, the idea of uh, one of her best known works, uh, National Estate, that she made in uh, 2012, came from the need for an autonomous Palestinian state. Sansur takes the ongoing uh, political situation with the story of Palestine as a direct reference in her work. In her words, in fact, she said, it is difficult to separate art from its direct political and social context. Art never operates in a vacuum. It is difficult for me to refer to my personal experience without referring to the political reality of the area in which I'm inserted. In a way, my interest in Palestine stems largely from being a native of Palestine and having experienced firsthand one of the world's greatest injustice. As I firmly believe that the Palestinian question is at the center of a series of global problems, it cannot be isolated as a mere local affliction. Uh, what you see in the National Estate work is a skyscraper where each floor houses a different Palestinian city. Jerusalem on the third floor, Bethlehem on the fourth floor, and so on. The artists interpret the possibility of a Palestinian state vertically, ironizing about the problem in question and the illegal confiscation of Palestinian land by the Israeli state. The struggle is what defines us as a Palestinian, says Sansur. If you take that distance, what is left? In the video, Sansur uses objects such as the Kethia and the Key as visual references to traditional iconography, which are now associated with the idea or the act of resistance. Her work is a comment on identity politics and a complaint about the lack of a space where to project the, mem the memory of identity which, despite a prolonged struggle, may lose its value and get trapped within a cliché. The symbols then have a formalist complicity within her non-documentary strategy. Her narrative challenged the value of the symbols the challenge depending upon the context. As, for example, in another work, A Space Exodus, another video she made in 2009, where the Palestinian flag is decontextualized and associated with progress and futurism by landing on the moon. The flag then begins to look different and relates to a new utopia. The work referred to the Nakba, the exodus of 700,000 Palestinians from their land in 1948 and the consequence of this event which prevail nowadays. The play reflects the fact that the Palestinians are in a stateless limbo and their homeland is reduced to a blur on the horizon. Landing on the moon reflects the common anxiety of the Palestinians. Once they leave the land, they run the risk of never being able to return home. A spice exodus is ultimately an examination of power. The blur between utopias and dystopias is a recurring theme in Samsung work which she uses ironically, behind which some optimism and hope is concealed, to address an issue as complex and dark as that of Palestine, where the law of colonization is still valid despite critiques of it elsewhere in the world by the UN. 
And to talk about the present dropped in limbo, Sansu plays with the concept of time, choosing to work with science fiction, which returns to the past and mingles with the future. Because what we do in the future is the result of what is happening in the present. When speaking of time, inevitably, Sansu commemorates the memory, which, as such, is tied to a concept of space or place, the same space for which Palestine continues to fight. Land confiscation order is the, is the uh, video we are going to, to watch tonight. Uh, in the conception of the Arab world, oral language uh, has historically been the greatest uh, reservoir of culture, identity and pride. Beginning in the 7th century, it was the Quran that had the greatest influence on, our, on Arab culture and literature. Indeed, more importance is given to the promise word than to any promise put in writing. The famous expression, uh, Kalima Sharaf, word of honor in Arabic, carries the idea that a betrayed promise results in immediate disgrace. From this perspective, Sansur's video, Land Confiscation Order 062014, uh, made in 2006, aimed to explore the need to restore in the image, conceiving it as a word, the substance and the weight that it once embodied, both physically as well as metaphorically. The video explored the promises made in the context of globalization and the underlying prospect of a future free of geographic and national borders. It does so by investigating the increasingly invaluable individual and private space, a space that is ironically only obtained through public and collective bargaining, and to what extent communication and social commitment facilitate the rise of individual freedoms. Land confiscation is a highly autobiographical short that Sansur made in 2006. The Israeli government sent a letter to her family announcing that the land and the house they inhabited would be confiscated by the Israeli state to build an exclusive road for settlers. To do this, it was necessary to cross the property inhabited by them and therefore expropriate the surrounding areas. It was not just the factual tone of the document that impacted the artist, but also the manner in which it was issued. Instead of being mailed to them, the letter was left unrestored on the family's property. This is a common tactic that Israel practices to communicate with the Palestinians. In the video, Larissa explored territorially as constituted not only of a national identity, but also of personal identity. Land confiscation order is composed of a requiem of a small piece of land and a house made of stone. It becomes a tribute to a dream of the viability of a national state, revealing the Palestinian identity as an entity eroded day by day, not only for political and cultural reasons, but also for geographical reasons. Although it is in Arabic to appear on camera, for this work, Sansur chose to step aside and tell the story of the dispossession of the family property through her sister and brother. Through covering the house completely with a black cloth, she achieves the effect of making both the house and the cloth fulfill in the ritual function of the recognition of material and geographical loss. The situation of the Palestinian people is crucial in series and anomalous. The Palestinians possess all the attributes of a national state common history, a language, a set of tradition, a cultural, a national culture, national institution, an official representative. But the Israelis refuse to recognize it, while the international community, with its plethora of UN laws and resolution against Israel, play the role of the lucky, without risking further measure other than appeasement. In a world in which the state of exception has become the rule, Palestine becomes the exceptional non-state sine qua non, deprived of the political and civil rights they use to rule their lives since they become refugees. Palestinians have been governed by the United Nations Convention and, in, and the occasional arbitrary application of international law. A country deprived of its culture exists only in an historical emptiness, without the sense of an ontology, a degree of introspection about our origin and the nature of our being. Consequently, there cannot be theology. 
nor can there exist a development projected towards an end. It consists instead of what that end is in the longer term. Without culture, in the best of cases, peoples find themselves adrift from the very coordinate of history necessary to produce a coherent argument, both social and political, in the present and even more decisively towards the future. Both culture and institution presuppose form of social participation. It is in such a moment of commitment that aesthetics is able to open a space where plurality and difference merge. How to resist the territoriality imposed by the state on the natural landscape as a violent act? Anibal Quijano, the renowned author of the theory of coloniality of power, narrates how the center periphery model was conceived to embody global capitalism as a paradigm of power after the Second World War. Sansu, for example, in her works, talk about the broken world contracts between neighbors and the power play behind this transaction of domination, describing it as a land without people for people without land. So now let's, let's go to Regina, Regina Jose Galindo. Uh, so um, despite the increasing democratization that followed the long era of dictatorship, the Latin American continent continued to show the highest indices of social inequality in the world. A true exponent of the loose art of repetition, Regina Jose Galindo repeats action. Repetition never coincides with the return of the identical, but it restores the possibility of what has been. It does not return the, pa return the past as such, but makes it all possible again. For this is it not a representation of, but a kind of theater of repetition that is at the center of the rituals that Galindo puts on, shade, on stage. Strange ceremonies, direct performances, and recitation realized in the here and now and repeated in a real action. Without conceiving of the repetition, her extreme actions, where the artist puts her body into play, are not fully explicable. Indeed, the poetic character of all her works, which she calls uh, psychomagic acts, acts, a term borrowed from Alejandro Jodorowsky, emphasize the tragic element. Consequently, they possess a strong emotional charge. Since her first performance in 1999, Galindo has conjurated the space of her body with the social, when unheard, she recites her poetry, suspended the meter above a city square in Ciudad de Guatemala, as we can see in this image. Her work explored the universal ethical implication of social injustice that are related to racial, gender, and other abuses that are involved in the unequal power relation that operate in our society. Galindo's artistic strategy is entangled with her identity and social politics, her work makes explicit the connection among social and identity politics. Galindo's performance can be defined as being motivated by a redemptive belief in the capacity of art to transform human life, as a vehicle for social change and as a radical merging of life and art. Work like Perra, which in English can be translated as a bitch, uh, done in 2005, in which she cuts her tie with a knife, or Imenoplastia, made in 2004, in which she underwent surgery to rebuild her amen, as different reception in Guatemala and elsewhere. These reflect the varying meanings of bodily representation, both in modern Latin American culture and internationally. Galindo's childhood and teenage uh, years coincided with the most brutal and violent episode of the Guatemala Civil War, especially with the regime of Rios Montt of 1992 and 1993. A reaction to that historical context was to turn a personal and political response to its horror into a bodily practice. Galindo's entire life and artistic practice is linked to the violence of the images of the war crimes of the Mont regime and as a strong expressive form of representation. Her work refers to unpleasant situation and alarming signs of deep existential discomfort with which our era struggles. 
Although her work always drew references from the lower levels of society and from women in particular, it also referred to global issues such as a repentant male violence, marginalization, subordination and torture. It deals with all of those others who have been subjected to violence. In her work, the body becomes the subject object of her performances, often pushing her physical and psychological limits toward the absolute thresholds. She transforms the, viewer, the viewers into aesthetic strategies that are designed to accentuate the great emotional impact of fragility and suffering on humankind. Galingo works recall what Eric Gans defined as a sacrificial aesthetics, where the aesthetic uh, forms that are born from bloody sacrificial practices have evolved from a necessary future of or social organization into intra-psychic element of the human condition. As the performance, quien puede borrar la huellas, who in English is uh, who can erase the, trace, the traces, which consists both of a 37 minutes video and photographic image that were realized on the 23rd of July in 2003 in Ciudad de Guatemala to protest against the unchallenged decision of the Supreme Court of Justice to authorize the candidacy again of General Efrain Rios Montt, ex-political leader of the extreme right who was responsible for a COP in 1982 and who, as dictator, has promoted the civil war and had a presidency that was marked by a campaign of violence, killings, rapes, torture, and oppressive tactics directed mainly against the indigenous people of Guatemala and on, on Guatemala. <laughs> on that day, Galindo, dressed in black, came out barefoot from her laboratory, carrying a white bowl full of human blood in her hands before going to headquarters of the Supreme Court of Justice. From there, she progressed through the city. At the end of the performance, she uh, reached the headquarters of the National Palace, the seat of the presidency of the country, where she left the last two footprints and the bowl of blood in front of the court building. Her aim was to ensure that the trace of bloody footprints would remain, at least for a short time, on the path from the branch of the executive power to that of the branch of the judicial power, highlighting the complicity of both in covering up an international policy of genocide. With the performance and the body as instrument of her artistic practices, through a sort of reenactment, the artist impersonates the weak and the humble, the tortured and the oppressed, highlighting the limit of body and mind. In this context, Regina is seen as a disturber who condemns the shortcomings of the social and political system, offering a clear diagnosis of a sick society, investigating crimes and deviances that alter policies and tackling controversial issues that others prefer to avoid. Her personal revolution, silent, is a conceptual approach immensely poetic and of almost unbearable pain. Her action represents the manifestation of a wooden soul. In her words, el mundo mordió mi corazón y contagió su rabia, y me contagió su rabia. The world beat my heart and infected me with its anger. Negotiation in turn, uh, in English we can translate it as negotiation in turn, uh, is a performance realized in 2013 uh, by, the, by the artist, by Regina, in a square in Medellin in Colombia and recorded for the 43 International Exhibition of Artists of Colombia. One morning in the center of the city, a group of volunteers line up to transport a coffin containing the artist waiting for their turn to transfer and deliver it to the next participant. From the coffin, the artist symbolized the sorrow of death and the weight of peace. Death waits, as does peace, mainly in a country like Colombia, although its weight is always greater for some than it is for others. Through such action and in silence, the volunteers transmit the idea of death, um, of death among those who take responsibility historically in the certainty that if they bend their knees, the weight will be heavier for others, say Regina. Behind this act, there is a political reflection related to the peace process in Colombia, as well as a comparison with the negotiation the Guatemala carried out in 1996. 
Every citizen should be aware of the political and economic processes that take place in their country. It is a responsibility that has been born and equally accepted by all, highlight Regina. For Galindo, the idea of that is much more intense in, ca in country like ours, which have experienced very acute conflict, which are gradually breaking down the coherences of social fabric. That is why her work focuses attention on sharing the burden on the concept of equitable responsibility. Although the act of transporting a coffee containing a living person could be considered macabre, for the artist it is an act of life and not of death. Life and death are the most important things in her work, or rather, they are two sides of the same coins. Galindo representation are globally considered both shocking and violent, but they are not the result of an empty provocation. In all of them, a manifesto of social criticism is read. Thank you. Thank you, Fortunata. Mm -hmm. We can uh, uh, watch the first video by Larissa. I will share my screen, so bear with me for a second. <clears throat> يعني انت مثلا تخيل انت لو عمرك تحلم بالارض لا تحلم بشيء ثاني احنا موجود هنا احنا ممكن نخسره ممكن اه اه كيف تحلم فيه بحلم اكثر في شعور بال آه عدم الامن شعور بانه انا مش في وضع امن اه وكيف يعني شو الصور اللي بتحلم فيها ممكن احلم مثلا مره حلمت انه آه انه دبابه مثلا دخلت في البوابه عندنا هون في البيت مم. مثلا هذا في هاي الصوره كمان تيجي باحلامي انا حلمت هذا الحلم انه دبابه دخلت في البيت البيت مم. كنا نلقط هناك اشياء كنا نلقط خبيزه نسكر التيتا دائما لها علاقه مع التيتا في هذا في الارض انه التيتا بتلقط اشياء من التيتا العجوز؟ لا انا ما بتذكرش التيتا العجوز برضه بجوز انت بتذكريها اكثر فبتذكر اكثر ب بالتيتا ب بس اظن المشكله بالنسبه لي انا مش مش متخيل احنا رح نخسر الارض يعني لسه مش مستوعب احنا رح نخسر الارض نحن تقريبا هنا هاي الفوتي هون هاي الفوتي هون على على الفوتي الفوتي هون على البولجي وهذا بنزل على ما بار هذا ما بار يصير زي ما بار تشوفوا هون ما بار بده يكون توسيع الشارع بده يكون من 
وين بيجي الدم؟ بين الشارع بين الخطين الحمر بين الخطين الحمر بين الخطين الحمر ايوه هذا عرض قول زي ما قلت في الامر القديم هاي الارض اللي رايحه باعتبار هذه الارض اللي رايحه مش كلها في ضمنها في ضمنها ضمن ضمن يعني انتم لكم تتحركوا فيها هاي هي الارض الخطين هذول الحدود أنا دائما بفكر في أفكار كيف ممكن الواحد يوقفهم إنه ياخذوا هاي الأرض بفكر إنه كثير بحب أبني هناك سرح زي بحب أبني هناك تمثال عالمي إنه الناس تعرف عنه والناس تحب تزوره إنه هو يكون نصب ل زي ذكرى للوضع اللي إحنا فيه طيب شو رأيك انت تشتغلي على هذا السرح وانا بشتغل على المشمش؟ هو ممكن يكون في نشوف الاول مين مزبط معه اكثر بس في نهاية الامر يعني كيف رح توصله؟ المشمش مش رح يخلي الجيش يسمح لك تدخل هناك عشان انت عندك مشمش في ملايين الناس عندهم زيتون يعني مش بس مشمش بخليهم مش يدخلوا بس اذا انت بتعرف انه الزيتون في القانون الاسرائيلي ما بمنعهم يدخلوا لانه هم بيعتبروا انه الزيتون هو عبارة عن إشي زي الأعشاب البرية اللي بتطلع اللي مش حدا زراعها فلا تعتبر مزارعة طيب بس المشمش مختلف لأن المشمش يعتبر إنه هو يعني حدا عم بزرع فهي حقل أو في حدا في مزارعين مشتغلوا في هالأرض يبين عندهم إنه في اعتراضات معينة <تصفيق> لما اجى الضابط وحكوا لنا انه ممكن نروح نشوف الضابط انا رحت مع كثير ناس هو كان مبتسم هو كان مبتسم هو يحكي لنا انه الجدار راح يمشي بهذا الشكل راح ياخذ هاي الاراضي هاي الاراضي راح تقدروا توصلوها بسماح خاص بتصريح خاص من خلال بوابه كل شيء عادي ما فيش مشكلة احنا كلنا عارفين انه هي مشكلة كل عارف انه هذا الاشي مستحيل فالكل كان منفعل انا سمعت برضو انه في ناس تعمل اشياء مرات عشان تثبت انه هي عاشة في هاي البيوت عشان تثبت ملكيتها لهذه البيوت صحيح؟ تعرف شو هو الاشي الوحيد اللي لازم يكون في موجود في البيت لإثبات فعلا انه انت عندك انه انت عايش في هذا البيت حلا حكالي مرة اشي غريب هو ايش هو؟ لازم يكون عندك زرار وخطان اه صح صح هم بيعتبروا انه اذا انت عايش في البيت رح يلاقوا هذا الاشي عندك أنا أكثر إشي بخاف منه لما الفترة رح تيجي اللي بعد ما نخسر الأرض لأن بحاول أفكر فيها مرات بفكر إنه رح يكون شعور دائم بإنه إحنا إنه إحنا فشلنا في إنه نحافظ على هالأرض إنه إحنا كنا نضحية لهذا الإشي وبخاف جدا بعدين في المستقبل مثلا إنه عمري أمر من هالأرض أو أقرب على هالأرض أشوف مثلا إنه فيها مستوطنة أو إنهم نجحوا يعني في مخططهم إنه أخذوا كل شيء وخلص وراحت علي
انا اكثر بفكر انه كيف لما يصير الجدار احنا رح نضلنا نقدر نروح على هاي الارض وكانه الجدار مش موجود شو بنقدر نسوي خطوات علشان نضلنا موجودين احنا هناك حتى لو هم حطوا الجدار انا اجتني فكره مره شو نعمل فكرت اسافر على امريكا واسير امريكي ولما يصح لي جواز سفر امريكي اغير اسمي واجي على اسرائيل كيهودي متعصب واطالب انه انا لا بحتاج استوطن ارض بالذات تكون منطقه المخلول واروح استوطن ارضنا رح تزرع مش مش هناك؟ اكيد And uh, now we're going to move on to uh, Regina Jose Galindo's film, Negociación en Turno.
Great. I'll pass it on to you for tonight. Huh? Thank you. Thank you, Regina and Larissa. These are very, very nice, uh, very nice work. I would like to start with a question to both of you. Um, and then slowly, slowly move to more singular uh, questions. I would like to understand how is uh, contemporary visual culture understood in a country with you know, civil war and political instability. We are all living in a time of political instability, but in the specific, in a country like Guatemala and Palestine, how it is conceived, how it is understood contemporary visual culture. Whoever, Larissa or Galindo first, whatever, whoever, over you. Creo que en el caso de Guatemala es sorprendente porque al finalizar la guerra, cuando firmamos la paz en el año 96, eh, descu se descubrió que habían muchas manifestaciones de arte. Es decir, durante los años de la guerra, eh, los creadores y las creadoras se protegían de alguna manera, pero nunca dejaron de producir. Eh, Y a mí me parece siempre muy curioso cuando alguna institución o algún curador llega a Guatemala y se sorprende de la cantidad de artistas que trabajan en el campo con unos discursos eh, muy sofisticados. Es decir, que el conflicto eh, generó sufrimiento, pero no retraso intelectual. Ah, uh, yes, so I can do a quick translation of that. Um... So Regina says, in Guatemala, in Guatemala, it's actually shocking because um, since uh, Guatemala signed peace in 1996, uh, there was found that there was actually a lot of manifestations of art throughout the time of conflict. And art makers had found different ways of protecting and um, concealing the ways in which art has been made and was being made. Um, in fact, it's quite common that curators or art professionals are actually surprised when they arrive in Guatemala um, only to find that artists actually work in the campo, which is like in the fields or in um, areas outside of cities. Um, and they're working really well with quite uh, kind of established and um, complex ways of working. Um, so it's clear that uh, there's not been kind of a, a, a pause on intellectual development due to the political situation. In fact, it's the opposite. It seems that they found different ways of working outside of it. Thank you. And uh, Larissa, do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I always think that uh, I kind of think of, um, say, um, European and American arts development have kind of uh, reached its kind of the most intense moment after World War II. And I feel like uh, in um, countries that ha are experiencing um, um, war or um, uh, or have been dislocated or um, have had um, occupation as in Palestine, you can see that there's a, a real in, uh, need to actually create work uh, that comes out of that environment. So can, you cannot really um, kind of expect an artist that comes from uh, those kind of regions to uh, be working on something that is like, you know, um, uh, unrelated to what's going on because that just feels dishonest. Um, so I think a lot of the work that's coming out of uh, Palestine is uh, quite potent. It's um, it's very engaged with the uh, political dialogue, and it's not because of you know a uh, that people need feel that they're or artists feel forced in that position, but that's because it's kind of an organic way of. Um, developing the art scene. Um, the art scene is also very kind of fractured in Palestine because uh, different uh, cities are, um, a, a Palestinian cities are hard um, uh, to uh, reach. So for example, when I go to Bethlehem, I have a hard time, you know, communicating with people in, uh, in Ramallah because it's uh, a very, um, 
uh, long way and you have to be interrogated and stop, stop by Israeli checkpoints. So, um, so it is fractured. And in the end, you end up talking to people over email or, you know, on the phone. So it doesn't really matter where you are in, in the end. And, and like, um, uh, and of course, Palestinians are kind of uh, dispersed all over the world. So uh, it is just very normal for Palestinian artists to just be speaking from very different countries. I've been living in many countries myself, and um, I've been uh, living most of my life outside of Palestine. So I think it's uh, the story of so many Palestinians. Thank you. Um, about what you said, Larissa, you said it is almost uh, uh, almost a responsibility no, of, of an artist to talk about. It's natural, no, to talk about the situation in Palestine. In Palestine, um, do you think uh, somehow unconsciously you feel uh, uh, forced to talk about it? I mean, um, it is something that uh, limitates the way you do art because you have mainly no you have to but you choose to no as an artist to talk about what is happening um but do you think this this can limitate your creation somehow um i i think it it depends on how you kind of um uh, proceed with um or how, how kind of the process develops i mean in the Kind of in the very beginning, I felt uh, when I, I started working, um, say in the early uh, 2000s, uh, with um, I, I had a very urgent need to document what was going on. Uh, there was the siege of Bethlehem, you know, Israeli tanks invaded uh, uh, Palestinian towns, they destroyed everything. There was a complete discrepancy between what was going on on the news and what, was, what really was happening on the ground. Um, and so it felt like you needed to kind of be like almost like a second eye uh, as an artist to document what's going on. And also for myself, like I wanted to make sure that, you know, my the town that I'm from didn't get erased. So I used a lot of my family, my friends as well, that we were actually existed there uh, because that's a real threat for Palestinians that to be, you know, to be historically uh, erased. Um, so, um, I think that was kind of how I was functioning on this kind of, you know, guerrilla style, you know, um, uh, filmmaking and trying to just get information uh, in, in those tapes. But um, I think now I have kind of uh, stepped back and I have a distance from it all. And I just find that artists always develop different strategies and revisions of how they work. So I feel that I'm not really limited by it, uh, rather that it is, um, it has developed into a much more elaborate way of working that it's not uh, where it actually, uh, my work kind of understands how to frame itself, not in a local dialogue, but it actually, it is something that is focal to uh, world structure. Well, actually it's something you always underline and I agree with your work because uh, for example, the, the video we just uh, we just saw is a kind of historical documental, and then your work and the change, a big change, because uh, you you started to use uh, science fictions, and I think you are you are still using it. So I think this is uh, like a result of what you 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 are saying somehow, no? That you you step aside and you you change the way also of narrating something. Mm -hmm. But this, um, this change uh, was volunteer. I mean, did you choose to change of being uh, like historical and documentary and perhaps also um, autobiographical um, and to, to, to talk in a way, in a, in a make, in a, in a made up way, like using fiction was uh, a choice you made or was uh, um, because of the response you had to your work, I don't know if I got into the point. Mm, um, uh, not really. It was. I wasn't. Uh, it wasn't the response. It was actually more of a. Um, I think that uh, it's kind of a, a very complicated problem to get into. In a way, it's a, a very um, you know, basic problem that, you know, there are people, there's an occupying power and uh, the Palestinians are 
oppressed and uh, it's a continuation of colonialism and Israel is uh, doing that. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, pretty straightforward. But at the same time, what happens psychologically to the, the oppressor and the oppressed, it's something that becomes intertwined. And, it's, and, and for me, that became something that's um, very interesting to explore or was part of uh, uh, understanding what forms the Palestinian psyche that became uh, much more interesting. And I found that uh, working with sci-fi kind of allows me not to be dictated by car the current political dialogue and uh, to kind of create a, a platform by which I can kind of set up my own terminology and find a new kind of uh, value system. And so it's um, kind of a natural development of how to, um, to find an alternative way of not talking about a very heavy uh, uh, political dialogue that already has a set of uh, of ways to talk about it. And you, you actually feel trapped in, in that. And I wanted to kind of uh, escape from it and actually talk about it on my own terms. Yes, of course, without using the same narrative that mm. we, are, we are full of. Um, Regina, you said, uh, I have a few questions also for Regina. Um, you said that every citizen should be aware of the political, you know, of the political process, of the political and social and economic process uh, happening in their country, actually the same you were saying, Larissa and uh, that uh, we have to be responsible for it. Uh, I have a few questions. Do you think we should be responsible also for what is happening elsewhere? And uh, you as an artist, both of you actually, you have the tools, you know, you have the tools to, to respond to this, uh, to this fact, to this political, economic and social uh, uh, events happening. Um, how a citizen should uh, uh, answer, how a citizen should uh, use his their conscious to, to be active, you know, and to do something as you do with your work. We don't, we don't have the same tools, we are not so creative, so how we can be useful and uh, um, be responsible of it. Um, being in our country and as well elsewhere, I really wish if I can answer in English, but it's difficult to me, so I will answer in Spanish in two or three phrases. Um, no considero que nadie, absolutamente nadie, es responsable de la situación política ni de su país ni del otro mundo. Yo hablaba de que somos responsables de tener conciencia política y social de lo que sucede. Sí, sí. Esto, esto quería decir, esto quería decir. Ciencia nos hace responsables como individuos. No, 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 claro. Esto quería decir de eh, tomar responsabilidad sobre lo que pasa, no que somos nosotros mismos los responsables de lo que pasa. Claro. Tampoco podemos tomar responsabilidad. Es decir, no soy responsable de lo que sucede y tampoco está en mis manos tomar esa responsabilidad. Uh -huh. El ser consciente de la realidad social de tu país eh, no te hace tener responsabilidad sobre esos hechos. Las, luego continuo. Um, so, uh, Regina just said, I do not, um, I do not consider that anyone or anyone at all is responsible for the politics of their country or indeed internationally of the world. No one is responsible for, for their own, for those politics. Um, they are responsible for their consciousness and for their awareness, though. Um, we cannot be responsible for any of the politics in any of our respective countries. The, those are not in our or my hands, but um, we can be aware and conscious of them. Considero que estamos hablando de países en conflicto, ¿no? Estamos poniendo ejemplo Palestina y Guatemala. Es decir, países que históricamente han sufrido, en el caso de Guatemala, una corrupción interna y en el caso de Palestina, corrupción desde afuera. Nosotros como pobladores no tenemos injerencia en esas políticas. We are talking about conflict, uh, countries that are full of conflict. In the case of Palestine, it's a co conflict that was brought about by external forces. And in the case of Guatemala, it is a case of um, conflict brought about by internal forces. Um, we cannot be responsible for either of those conflicts. 
de lo que considero que tenemos que ser responsables es tener memoria histórica, conocer los porqués de, nuestros, de nuestro conflicto en nuestras propias tierras y la responsabilidad que así acepto es de qué manera enfrentamos estos estados corruptos y fallidos. Esa es nuestra responsabilidad. De qué manera confrontamos esta situación, de qué manera admitimos una posición de resistencia y lucha y vivimos acorde a esto. I believe that uh, we are responsible for the historical memory. Um, we are responsible for the why, asking the why of our countries, why they are in these situations. And I believe that we are responsible for finding ways in which we can confront and resist the forces um, of, of these countries, of these states and these dynamics. Y luego, tampoco considero que un artista eh, tenga de manera innata esta cualidad de conciencia o responsabilidad social. En algunos casos, algunas artistas, algunos artistas que en su vida diaria tienen esa responsabilidad y esa forma de vida, lo replican en su arte. El individuo que es políticamente consciente y que tiene una forma de vida de lucha y resistencia, lo va a transmitir y lo va a transmutar en sus procesos creativos. Um, I do not consider that an artist has an innate ability to be political or has any innate tools to um, resist. Um, some artists might be able to do this and will be able to reproduce this in their in their work. However, individuals are also able to do this by channeling kind of creative means. Um, I don't know if you want to open the question to the audience first and then we can add to you more questions. Uh, sí. how, how you... I have a question in my chat. Yes, I am a little bit here. If you want to answer. There are two for you, the two actually. In the case Mala, eh, me preguntan si estamos siendo representados por artistas latinoamericanos o por voces más de occidente, ¿no? Eh, en el caso de Guatemala, no estamos representados por nadie más que por nosotros mismos. Guatemala tiene muchas dificultades para salir de acá. Es, de cierta manera nos hemos visto obligados a nacer y permanecer en este país. Eh, los artistas mayas no necesitan ser representados, ellos hablan por sus propias voces. Yo soy una artista mestiza, eh, pero tampoco necesito este tipo de representación o una voz que hable por mí. En el caso de Guatemala yo me siento muy orgullosa porque... Hemos conseguido cosas y a tener un, hemos conseguido tener un espacio en el sistema del arte internacional a través de nuestro propio trabajo y nuestra propia voz, no a través de injerencias o de la utilización de nuestra voz. In Guatemala, uh, the question that was asked was, do you think that um, Latino art is being presented by Latin critics and artists or more by Western voices? And the response is that in Guatemala, we are not um, represented by anyone but ourselves. Um, in Guatemala, it is the case that it is hard to leave. And in some ways, we're somewhat obliged to stay in the country. Um, it's also true that the Mayan artists do not need actually other voices. They can explain and express their own art in their own voices. Um, and as a mestiza, uh, mestiza is the term used for people with mixed heritage. Um, uh, Regina also does not need a voice, um, does not need a voice to represent her in that way. And actually there's a lot of pride in the fact that in Guatemala, uh, they have managed to create a space for their art um, by using their own voice rather than that of anyone in the West or any Western platforms. Um, I would like to ask uh, 
very uh, actual question to both of you. Um, we were talking about before with Larissa. Uh, how did you, um, what, what was your reaction to the time we are living? You know, it's more than one year that our lives change. Uh, the um, art field actually is in, in an impasse because uh, all the institutions around the world, or almost in all around the world, are, are closed. The galleries, the, the, the museums. Um, that's why actually we are all here online. So, um, did it have an, uh, an impact in your work, in your uh, artistic process? Or on the contrary, I mean, the, did it uh, stop your creativity? Or was it, uh, on the contrary, an impulse, you know, to do more because you have this, this feeling of overcome this, this time and to use it somehow to, to new production and uh, new creativity? Or you, or you have a crisis? I don't know. How did you um, it? Yeah, in my case, I just... Um... Uh, in the beginning, obviously, it was very stupefying, the whole process, the whole uh, uh, pandemic, because you actually, for me, it became kind of a, um, a uh, materialization of everything that I'm talking about in my own work. Um, and if you, um, I, I, I finished the work that I showed in Venice called In Vitro, that's um, basically means life outside of its own of its natural habitat and it was all about a group of scientists that escaped a, a disaster and um, they uh, ran to a bunker under the city of Bethlehem and so for me uh, with the with the pandemic it just felt that this scenario is actually uh, becoming um, re, be, uh, is reitified you know in this uh, um, in this moment and so i got uh it became too real for me to continue with a, a project that was actually based on this project uh and so i completely changed the film to something completely different because i felt i needed to to free those people from the bunker to go outside but the idea of the bunker is uh, basically this entrapment of um that uh palestinians find themselves in uh, of um, of being in a limbo where they constantly remember 1948 and the Nakba and the, you know Palestinian exodus and constantly speaking of a future a Palestinian state and and the protracted um, uh, pandemic felt like uh, very real in that sense. So for me, it was kind of uh, my uh, a, a, a universal lockdown that I kind of actually speak about in in the film where whatever um if we're let to, for the events to take place and, and continue uh a natural disaster uh will happen and um so um so so it, it kind of uh, was a, a prediction or a what well, you know reality became stranger than fiction in that way um and and thinking about uh, how i usually to talk about time and the fact that with the erection of the state of Israel, Palestinians have been kind of catapulted into a historical time. They kind of exist in this bubble that's outside of uh, you know, homogeneous time. Uh, and I just felt that with uh, the with the lockdown, it felt like we're all kind of experiencing uh, this. Yeah. yeah. And do you think with the lockdown, uh, uh, sorry, Regina, now I give you the, the voice to answer. Do you think with the lockdown, uh, uh, people can perceive better the Palestinian situation uh, as locked? Or, uh, yeah, I, I think the claustrophobia. Yeah. Moving, no, with this impossibility of moving. Or, the impossibility of moving, the uh, the claustrophobia of just kind of being controlled by something bigger than you. I mean, that's, this is something that I was born with, you know, so I escaped the lockdown in Palestine to, uh, and then this is coming this, but uh, what happened uh, with work is actually, even though a lot of shows got postponed or canceled, some 
institutions actually uh, will never reopen now as yeah. it's very sad that um, some commissions were withdrawn but um, at the same time because um, I started the project I was just continuing with the project and working on it and I'm currently uh, actually working on two so in, in a way it actually was a very intense working time for me as well yeah. Okay, so you didn't lose your credit. Mm. <laughs> and what about you, uh, Regina? Um... Yo tenía más de 15 años de no estar en mi país por más de un mes. Ha sido un cambio eh, dramático en mi vida. Pero a mí todos los dramas y todas las crisis me motivan a producir más, motivan mi creatividad. Es decir, cuando yo siento que estoy a punto de perder la batalla, es cuando más trato de saltar y salir del fondo. Entonces, las, la, todas las emociones negativas eh, y esta crisis de inicio de la pandemia me motivó a, a no cruzarme de brazos. He producido más que nunca a lo largo de este año. Ah. Ok. Um... Ay, Coja, me gustaría, bueno, si quieres, un, en un segundo párrafo. Um, I have had as... So in the past 15 years, I have not been in Guatemala for more than one month at a time. So actually this past time in the pandemic has been a huge change. Um, crisis uh, ends up motivate me. And when I feel I am about to lose a battle is when I am most able to find motivation. So I've actually had a quite a productive period um, given the circumstances currently. De cierta manera este año que he estado encerrada en Guatemala, me regresó a mis orígenes. De un golpe, fue un, ha sido un golpe muy duro, ¿no? Porque me ha regresado a entender de dónde vengo y las precariedades terribles del lugar de donde vengo. A mí este evento, ¿verdad? Con, con Larisa, siento mucha empatía, una gran empatía con Larisa por ser una artista palestina, porque a lo largo de la pandemia y especialmente en estos últimos meses, nos hemos sentido en cercanía con Palestina. Guatemala es de los, es quizás el, quizás no, es decir, Guatemala es increíblemente el único país donde no se, donde seguimos estando sin vacunas y recibimos una donación mísera de Israel de 5000 vacunas que fueron distribuidas en el ejército. Esto es mi país y a esta realidad fue lo que me regresó esta pandemia. Eh, no puedo decir que, que soy feliz en esta realidad pero de cierta manera esta vuelta a mis orígenes me han hecho volver a pensar y repensar de dónde vengo y las carencias de esta tierra que me vio nacer. Y me motiva, por supuesto, a seguir produciendo en Guatemala y me motiva a seguir en conversaciones con mis colegas, porque es verdad, es más que nunca creemos que el arte sigue siendo una fuerza motora de lucha. Um, in some way, uh, being locked in Guatemala has locked me to my roots, which is where I originally come from. And it has kind of re-shown me the precarity and the situation of where I live. Um, I feel a lot of empathy with Larissa because during this time, I feel like we felt very close to Palestine. Um, and due to the precarity that the countries um, both share. In Guatemala, it's still one of the few only countries that hasn't received a vaccine. And the only vaccines that we have received have been um, 5,000 vaccines donated by the Israeli state, which actually directly came from them, went to the military in Guatemala. Um, this is my country. Um, it's not something uh, I'm particularly proud of, and I may not be particularly happy to live here, but being in Guatemala has really shown me what the country is. It has brought me back to my roots and it has motivated me to continue to work here, to continue to work with people here and think about what this means. Thank you. Very touching what you're saying. And uh, I share the same, the same view because also for me it was uh, a way of uh, reconnecting with myself and with my root. I think it's some kind of process we all went through during this, um, this time. I don't know if you want to say something in particular, Larissa, Regina, if you want to talk about something in particular about the video we, we show. I know it, they are both old video, old, old work, 
but if, if you want to add something or want to say something about the videos or about anything of your work, if you want to add something to this conversation, I just to step stuck on my question. Um, maybe we can answer um, a, a question um, about uh, mourning and grief. Yeah. Uh, that's been chat. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm reading it and I, I think I would like uh, to see how actually Larissa and Regina saw it, if they saw it and if they can both see. Actually, Regina just said that she felt empathy with uh, Larissa and probably also with the work we just, we just saw. I would like to know also if this question, if Larissa saw, uh, you know, parallels with the work of Regina on, in, in general, you know, with uh, Guatemala, with Latin American and Guatemala in particular, uh, because of course I see these parallels. That's why I am talking about all of them. But I would like to see if you see this as well, Regina and Larissa. Yo haría una, haría una relación básica entre ambos pueblos, respetando las diferencias, por supuesto. Pero sabemos que todo conflicto, que toda guerra, se origina por la tierra. Palestina es un país ocupado, Guatemala es un país saqueado. Ambos países tenemos una tragedia humana debido al robo de nuestras tierras, porque las tierras en nuestros países valen mucho. Y a raíz de todo, a raíz de nuestras tierras, de este robo indiscriminado, de, ese, de esas actitudes depende nuestra precaria vida y nuestro destino y nuestro futuro. Estamos en manos de poderes internacionales, ajenos a nosotros. Y en eso me parece que hay una cercanía muy grande. Um, I would like to do, like, draw a basic uh, relationship between the two places that we've been talking about, of course, whilst respecting all of their differences. All conflict is due to land, earth, um, or earth, uh, whether it's been ransacked in the case of Guatemala or whether it's been occupied in the case of Palestine. Um, this act of stealing land, the process of stealing and occupying land is what has resulted in precarity. And in fact, um, both of these places are currently um, in the hands of uh, external international forces that do not belong to the people that are currently living there. Yeah, you, Larissa, do you see any parallels? Um, yeah, um, I, maybe I see parallels in how, um, as an artist, you kind of try to um, speak, I mean, find ways of talking about uh, uh, an, an emotion or a um, what all these structures kind of um, end up doing to your psychology or uh, what, what's the emotive aspect of that and find different ways of um, trying to transgress the normal um, way of talking about these things. And I think that's the, the similarity, similarity I see in, in the work where um, it's always this kind of trying to find this um, a very specific platform by which one can speak of these things, which is quite hard. Uh, I think in, in land confiscation order, for example, uh, it was very difficult for me to just kind of um, address what was going on without using documentary. So in a way, uh, this combination of the two was um, um, a, a way for me to tell the story in an, uh, in, in an emotional or emotive way. Um, and I can see that uh, with uh, Regina's work, it's uh, it's also even though it's um, kind of you can call it a political reaction to uh, uh, what's going on. It's also it's very laden with emotion. I mean, the, the, I mean, what I, for example, from the last film, uh, kind of kept on thinking is like how is Regina herself is uh, doing in the uh, coffin. Uh, and you can't help but notice the people that are, you know, 
for a long time carrying this coffin. So you start thinking about it in a in a very kind of uh, personal way, and I think that's quite tricky, and it's it's hard to get there in in your work. I think it's also interesting to see as uh, a two different you know national representation of uh, of a national reality uh, can mingle no you know we are talking about guatemala palestine palestina palestine and uh, actually they express in a different way the same poetic as well no both work are very poetic and uh, they both express uh, a, a national problems but you reflect in the other as well, no? Um, as I, I see myself in, uh, in both, you know, in both reality, and I'm not Palestinian, I'm not Latin American, I'm Italian, so I see a piece of myself there. So perhaps it's, as Regina was saying before, that we, when you have an, a conscious towards the problem that are from your country or from outside, this is expressed as well in your case, in, in your work, in my case, in my words, perhaps, or in this kind of, of meetings. Um, but both, both are very, very strong, uh, very strong work with uh, very strong uh, meaning and narrative to me. I actually get emotional when I, when I see your work. I'm very fan of both of you. So for me, it's very nice to be here with you. And really, really thank you for uh, giving me this, this chance, you know, to have both of you here. I think we reached the point in which we have to close, perhaps, uh, the, the meeting, no? Tavian is telling me. <laughs> Yeah, we are we are coming coming to an end. But if there's any fine one final question that anyone in the audience um, would like to ask, please go ahead and um, take yourself off mute or um, add to the chat. Otherwise, I have a final question to both of them, if I can. In the case of uh, of Larissa, it is a more a more political question, and perhaps uh, I don't know. You choose what to say. <laughs> uh, do you think the political situation in uh, Palestine has reached an impasse or do you think behind hope, because we all hope, we all have the same hope, or do you think something we can, uh, something uh, can we ever change? Well, that's it. Um. I mean, I think negotiations on the ground have reached an impasse, but um, there are certain ways of how um, um, things are developing there that kind of cannot stay uh, like that uh, any longer. So in, in a way, something will happen. I'm not really sure if it's going to be uh, for uh, better or worse. Um, but I'm just speaking about the latest development, for example, Regina saying that uh, Guatemala received 5,000 uh, vaccinations from Israel uh, to Guatemala, but they're refusing to give Palestinians any uh, vaccination. So, vac uh, so uh, uh, Palestinians are held imprisoned by, you know, an occupying power. But the Israel Israeli argument is that well, they have their own country, so they're not responsible. Yet they are the ones imprisoning um, these people. Um, so in that sense, I think it beca it's becoming much uh, kind of clearer or blatant to the world that uh, um, Israel is actually uh, breaking uh, human rights law. Yeah. Um, so I think it kind of, you know, public opinion matters in that way. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, things will change for the better soon. We always, we all hope. <laughs> Thank you. And, 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 and in Guatemala, Regina, do you think uh, Guatemala is changed? Do you think uh, the situation will get better or, or Guatemala is in, in an impasse and the situation will get stuck? Estamos peleando con uno de los gobiernos más corruptos que hemos tenido en la historia. Esas 5,000 vacunas que el gobierno de Israel donó es porque Guatemala ha sido siempre una escuela eh, de aprendizaje 
de las fuerzas militares israelitas. De hecho, Israel apoyó nuestra guerra, nuestro genocidio. Por esa razón es que Israel dona vacunas a Guatemala. Y estas vacunas no son repartidas en la sociedad, son repartidas dentro del ejército. Y me gustaría cerrar con un poema. Eh, Sí, por favor. pero mucho, ¿verdad? Siento, pensé en este poema, creo que tiene mucho, habla mucho de la situación en Guatemala y en Palestina. Um, ¿Quieres que traducimos antes hasta aquí y luego tú dices el poema? Uh, in Guatemala, we currently have one of the most corrupt governments of all time. And uh, actually, the reason that Guatemala was able to receive those vaccines from Israel was because Guatemala has now for a long time been under the training or the schooling of uh, the Israeli military. Um, and the reason that they sent us those vaccines was because of that. Um, and those vaccines went to military only. Um, and that's because you know, Israel has been training the Guatemalan military for a long time now. So those vaccines will never and did not see kind of the community um, or serve the community of Guatemala. And um, Regina also uh, wants to share a poem um, that uh, speaks, I think, a lot to the Uh, the relationship, also the situation, both in Palestine and uh, Guatemala. Multiplíquense solamente para multiplicar su tragedia, o nazcan para inmediatamente morir. Hagan de sus manos sus propias asesinas, o dennos razones para poderlos matar. Que no es culpa de nadie lo que pasa en el mundo, que el hambre es suya, y la tierra es nuestra. Y ustedes, que nosotros seguimos siendo los de siempre, y ustedes son cada vez más. I will now try my best to translate this, uh, bear with. So, multiply yourselves only if you want to multiply your tragedy, or be born to only immediately die. Make of your hands of assassins, make of your hands of your own assassins, or give us reason to be able to kill them. It is not anyone's fault, that which happens in the world, that the hunger is yours and that the earth is ours, that we will always continue to be the ones of forever, and you will always continue to be more. Thank you. Thank you. It's actually a great place to, um, to end. I want to thank everybody who's present here with us tonight and um, our speakers, Larissa, Regina, and Fortunata. Um, we're going to put um, a feedback form in the in the chat and we would like if anybody um, would like to fill that out and just give some feedback on the event um, and this is obviously like I said at the beginning our last event in our research network um, series global revisions and we'll be announcing um, the next programming in our newsletter so you can sign up for um, for that via our website So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tavia. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Yes, Regina. Thank you, Larissa. Tavia. Bye. Bye bye.